Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm reacting to Indian Philosophy 5 Minute Crash Course as Abijit. I'm sure I mispronounced that one. E23Q6. So, this was requested to request. If you have a request, please leave the title, the video link, and the YouTube channel so I can search for it and add it. If you put a link, it might get put for held for review, and I don't go looking there. There's a lot of comments in there, a lot of spam comments. So anyways, that's interesting. Um, actually, I, I did, let's play real quick. I played just the intro just to make sure there's uh, audio, but let's play it Why real quick. Why are... Okay. Well, we'll get started in a way, and then he's going to read the questions in a way, so let's go ahead. Our Indian philosophy is neglected from the mainstream philosophy. And in India, despite the fact that it had every topic like epistemology, ontology, psychology, metaphysics, physics etc this is okay so mainstream philosophy i never thought about what is mainstream philosophy i've never thought about or looked into it honestly so i guess people who look into mainstream philosophy would have a lot more to say about this but at least from my observation and what little i have observed I don't know how popular mainstream philosophy is. I have a feel, at least in the Western world, it doesn't seem like it is mainstream at all. It is severely lock, lacking philosophy. Um, so that whether that's Eastern or Western philosophy, for that matter. But yeah, I, I never thought about um, uh, say mainstream philosophy in general. I again, my philosophy journey started on this channel, not from the start of this channel, we did something else different, but um, a bit later on. And uh, again, I don't know what mainstream philosophy is. Is there like a particular person who's mainstream philosophy? Maybe Jordan Peterson? Although he's more of a scientist than a philosophy, I think. The only mainstream philosophy I know is Eastern philosophy so far. No no Western philosophy as yet. Still need to try to dive into that part. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, CC back on. An excellent question, sir. So you are absolutely right. Indian philosophy has been totally neglected in India's uh, philosophy curriculum. You go to mm. any philosophy department in India and you see the curriculum, they'll teach you about Plato, about Aristotle, about Kant, Hegel, Hume. They will teach you Gandhian philosophy, whatever the hell that is. <laughs> Genghis Khan philosophy, really? <laughs> okay, uh, I, okay, I get those. Actually, I, I probably should look into people who's teaching about those philosophies, the the more Western philosophy, just to see what their philosophy is about. I, I hear them referenced quite a bit, and in all honesty, there was an EBR battle with between Western and Eastern philosophy, and I believe most of the Eastern philosophies are Chinese on in, in, in that one, which is interesting. I need to go back and watch that one. And look up those people and their teachings just to see what their philosophy is about. But that's kind of strange, saying in India as well. Uh, luckily enough, um, was it uh, Swami Sarvapriyananda has actually taught in IIT, I believe. I, luckily enough, I say that. I didn't realize it was kind of lacking. That's kind of uh, that's kind of part of the heritage of India. It's kind of it's genuinely sad. It's kind of same thing with uh, I guess you could say in America that there is no. <laughs> say Indian teachings as well, but is, that is not necessarily the culture that dominated in America. Uh, and put it this way too, uh, Indian culture, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, American Indian culture is kind of dying even within the Indian pe population, I do believe. It's just genuinely sad to see uh, or to hear at least some of the Indian population saying that their children are not interested in their culture. And it's it's sad. I, I've I've went to powwows before, and it's generally really cool, and I would love to learn it. And I don't know. It's obviously we don't want to force anyone into anything they're not interested in, but it it would be terrible to see certain cultures just to just I guess that's just what happens uh, throughout the years is whatever's not as interesting just kind of fades away. They'll teach you about Jiddu Krishnamurti. They will teach Dalit philosophy, whatever that is. 
they'll teach you about the frankfurt school about critical theory about feminist uh, philosophy etc but they won't teach you anything significant about indian philosophy yeah. and indian philosophy is way older and way richer than all of this right and these schools of western philosophical thought have been borrowing from indian philosophy for centuries without ever acknowledging the fact that they are borrow borrowing from us right so there are indian philosophy is vast it is it is enormous there are so many schools of thought at least seven uh, major significant schools of thought and we just don't know about them we think everything comes from the west let me tell you a little <laughs> bit about indian philosophy so you have seven eight nine schools of indian philosophical thought major and there are way more uh, subsidiary subsidiary schools and other schools so the nine major ones are charvaka jain uh, bodh nyaya vaisheshik sankhya yoga mimamsa and vedanta these are these are nine major schools so charvaka is materialism it says that perception is the only valid source of knowledge the material world is the only reality the existence of god is a myth the vedas are false and wrong and the highest aim of life is the enjoyment of the greatest amount of pleasure they also kind of i believe if i remember correctly from the last video that uh, that taught about uh shakvara i believe it was um is that if you steal it and no one sees it it's okay <laughs> which is what no and again i guess i am coming from this perspective that the material world is the real world however i'm still very much open to other things it's just that it's very from my personal experience it's very difficult to accept some of these other teachings but still i will definitely learn and i will try to experience it if i can but until i do or until i can justify it um, I'm not just going to believe it just because. And again, people have made very interesting comments about the uh, about the consciousness and the material, how the material forms the consciousness. That's actually a very interesting topic too. So this is pure materialism. Mm -hmm. This is Charvaka. It is one of the Charvaka. major schools of thought of Indian philosophy. It is part of Hinduism. So this is an atheistic school of thought. Mm -hmm. It is part of Hinduism. Then you have Jaina. the jaina philosophy which rejects the charvaka view that perception is the only source of knowledge jaina says that inference and testimony are also valid sources mm -hmm. the jaina school of thought comes from 24 tirthankars tirthankars of whom the 23rd was parshvanath and the 24th the last one was vardhaman mahavir so the jaina school of thought believes in the believes in the existence of souls it says souls exist humans animals plants microorganisms even dust grains have souls but not every soul is equally conscious some are more conscious some are less conscious and according to the jaina school of thought the aim of existence is of liberation liberation by removing all the accumulated karmas of of the different uh, incarnations by following the teachings of the tirthankars the liberated saints and the jaina school also is an atheistic school of thought because it rejects the existence of god then you have bodha philosophy bodha philosophy is about the four noble truths number 1 there is misery in life number 2 there is a cause of misery number 3 there is a cessation of misery and number 4 there is a path that leads to the cessation of misery and this is the so called the the eightfold noble path of Buddhism. Oh, that's where he said the bod, and the, whenever he said the four noble truths, like that's Buddhism. Uh, I guess I, 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 I'm the the typing on or the CC on here, closed captioning, it says both. <laughs> it's trying its best to uh, uh, type out, I guess, type out what he's saying. But is it is it B O D I? I remember seeing that somewhere, and I don't know if that's what he's trying to say. And I guess that's the path of uh, Buddhism. In Buddhism, the aim of existence is the cessation of misery, the cessation of the cycle of rebirths. It is to attain enlightenment or nirvana. Then you have Nyaya, which is a school of thought that owes its existence to the great sage Gautama. This is a realistic philosophy based on logic. There are four separate sources of true knowledge: Pratyaksha, Anuman, Upaman, and Shabda. it says that the self the atma is distinct from the mind and from the body and again the ultimate aim is the liberation of the soul and nyaya believes in the existence of god then you have vaisheshik which so wait nyaya 
believes in the existence of God. I wish you'd put this in uh, duality or non-duality as well. I kept, it, it's been a while since I've reacted to those videos and it's been only about one video or maybe two videos about the discussions of the different schools of philosophy, Indian philosophy. So it's kind of, and I haven't reacted to any recently, so it's kind of, it's kind of been vague. I, I barely remember. I do remember certain things. But generally speaking, I guess maybe the belief in, I don't, I don't remember if the belief in God automatically makes it dualism. Because... Even in Advaita Vedanta, I believe you can believe in a god, but understanding that this is just a a false god in a sense. It's a path to truth, which is there's only one god, and that god is you, or the universe, and you, I believe. Owes its origin to the great sage and scientist Kannada. So according to Vaisheshik, there are there are seven categories of substances, nine kinds of substances, four kinds of atoms, which are invisible, indestructible particles of matter. And therefore, the Vaisheshik school of philosophy is the first quantum theory. According hmm. to this theory, the mind is eternal. It's infinitely small, like an atom. So there is a quantum of mind as well. And the ultimate aim again is the liberation of the, of the soul. And according to this theory, God exists. Then you have Sankhya, which is dualistic realism, which owes its existence to the sage Kapil. You have Yoga, which owes its existence to Patanjali. Right? You have Mimansa, which owes its existence to Jaimini. It is based on the Vedas, which is again an, an atheistic school of thought. Right? It says that whatever the Vedas command, one to perform is dharma and what they forbid is wrong it says the soul is immortal and eternal but there is no supreme soul or creator god it says that the, that the law of karma is the autonomous natural and moral law that rules the world and finally you have so our souls in that one I, i'm sorry i'm gonna i'm gonna rewind that one because it makes it seem like each individual soul is separate from each other so and there's no Atman or Brahman, which is old, like basically what everything is, including the souls. But this one, the souls are separate. I don't know how far I have to go with that one. And one to perform is Dharma, and what they forbid is wrong. It says the soul is immortal and eternal, a bit which more. is again an, an atheistic school of thought, which owes its existence to Jaimini. It is based on the Vedas, which is again an Sorry. existence to Patanjali. Kapil, you have yoga which owes its existence yoga. to Patanjali, okay. right? You have Mimansa which owes its existence to Jaimini. It is based on the Vedas, which is again an, an atheistic school of thought, right? It says that whatever the Vedas command one to perform is Dharma and what they forbid is wrong. It says the soul is immortal and eternal, but there is no supreme soul or creator God. It says that the, that the law of karma is the autonomous natural and moral law that rules the world. And finally, you have Vedanta, which arises from the Upanishads. It's considered to be the culmination of Vedic thought. According to Vedanta, there is a supreme person who permeates the entire universe and yet remains beyond the universe. Person? Like God? One God? Hmm. I've heard it uh, again with uh, Swami Sarvapi Ananda that um, the one thing that stuck out to me that I genuinely do, I can believe. It's very easy to believe, but I just don't know if it's true. Um, only because there's, I guess, because I'm constantly in this uh, materialistic idea, which is for me very easy to believe just because. We can clearly see, I can touch, feel, and try to press that this pen does exist. But the underlying creation of existence itself can be Brahman, which again, meaning that Brahman itself is um, materialistic. It's like energy, it cannot be created nor destroyed, it can only change forms, which makes sense. Um, the, the Earth is made of Brahman, I am made of Brahman, my mind is made of Brahman, this pen is made of Brahman. Uh, and Brahman being that of the the absolute smallest atom 
or whatever the smallest thing is that you that if you keep digging deeper and deeper there's nothing deeper than that that is literally the fabric of existence and you cannot go any further than that like how we discovered the sheer fact that we thought atoms were the smallest it's not then we find out protons and neutrons were smaller than an atom because uh, the nu- uh, sorry, the nucleus, then protons, neutrons, and then something smaller than protons, neutrons, which is electrons. Then there's, I don't know how small God particles are, or whatever they're called scientifically, but we keep finding things that are smaller and smaller as our technology advances. And, um, and eventually, maybe science can get far enough to explain some things, but I know there is a limitation to science. It cannot explain everything. Nothing is... I don't want to say nothing is, but I, I just don't know what the limitations are as of right now. Clearly, science cannot tell you how to live life wonderfully. That is science. That is something science cannot do. Uh, science, in my opinion, is something that's very rigid in its in its uh, in how it does things. I don't know how to explain that well. But again, I guess <laughs> the example is this: science will say. This is black. Okay, maybe it's black, right? Does it look black to you? You say it's like maybe purple, red, because of the way the the sun, the, the sun, <laughs> the um, the uh, if I can get it in the shade, but the way it's looking. But if you were to hold it, it's like yeah, it looks black. It's black. Everyone can can say it's black. It's like okay, science will then say okay, it's more than likely black. Um, there's a little clicky there. Whenever I do this, just making noise. You hear the noise, I hear the noise, okay, we can we can say that it makes noise when you do this. That's kind of the way science works. It has to verify uh, many ways and try to disprove it before it can say, okay, this is, as far as we know, true. <laughs> I don't think, I've heard some scientists say that they can never 100% say something is true. They'll say, this is a pen. As far as we know, it's a pen. <laughs> it's like a way for them to cover their tracks so they can never be wrong. It's like, it's a pen. Yeah, I think we can say it's a pen. It's safely enough to say it's a pen. We agree? We agree? Okay. It may be it's a pen. It's pr- 99.99% sure it's a pen. And uh, I think that's the way a lot of science is going to be because there's a potential potentiality out there that it could be not a pen. And because of that potentiality, they'll say it's 99.9% sure it's a pen or something like that, I believe theory of uh, of gravity um the big bang theory there's a lot of evidence that support it but they'll never say yep that's ab- that's fact that's true <laughs> so as you can see these are different models of the universe these are different theories mm-hmm. these are so uh so detailed and, and and these these are vast schools of thought you can spend an entire lifetime just researching one and mm. that is the entirety of indian philosophy and there is much more beyond it so it is it is incredible that indian universities colleges etc do not teach about this in any detail there is some cursory reference to these things but unfortunately none of this is taught, taught in any detail and in indian philosophy uh, like i said it, these are different models of the universe these are different theories proper theories philosophical theories unfortunately indian philosophy stopped evolving 1000 years ago with the destruction of our great indigenous universities and today in india's modern colonized universities they teach western philosophy so that's a great tragedy i wish this were to change sometime soon okay just to a uh, little bit of comment at the end india hopefully is now your uh, hopefully india is owned by the indian people now and people sh- i mean there, there's here's the part of responsibility um again i don't know what the situation's like over there i don't know if there's lots of money being pumped into universities from say western influencers or whether this is just the the you know they think this is what's needed to succeed in in i guess a western dominated world in a sense um but i mean if india hopefully if india wants to teach indian philosophies they can and nothing's stopping them from that it's just merely maybe it's not something that's how do i say um doesn't seem like it's needed in the modern times Although, trust me, um, a lot of it is actually needed 
quite badly, honestly. And I don't know about Western philosophies either. Again, I didn't, I don't, I don't, I haven't touched up on that yet. But in terms of just how, again, personal experience with, um, with what I've seen in Western worlds, especially, especially in the Western world, where a lot of people think that they're entitled to things that they're that they de they, they demand things even though they don't deserve it i believe no one is entitled to anything i don't believe anyone deserves anything i do believe in earning things but even then it doesn't necessarily mean that you should get it even if you think you earn it how do i say that more properly just because you did something doesn't mean that you deserve it or you earned it so how do I say? So even though I speak really well in this YouTube channel, doesn't mean I earned your su subscription or your likes or your down below, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, even though I, I do real well, uh, it doesn't mean I've earned your su your subscription or likes or dislikes or whatever. It's it's all a matter of whether you believe it to be, and then you're the one who's gonna do it. Not me. I'm not going to sit there and say, like and subscribe down below and make a comment about something and share this with people or whatever. Ultimately, you make the decision on that one. And and you determine whether I earned it or whether I've not earned it. Whether I deserve it, whether I'm entitled to it, which I hope no one ever says I'm entitled to anything. That's terrible. Deserve it? Sure. I do believe other people can say, oh, you deserve this. But the person who deserve it can never say, I, I personally should never say that I deserve this. I think that that kind of leads to a little bit of a uh, a bad thought. Oh, I'm getting way off subject here. <laughs> but it's more along the lines of the fact that I, listening to Sadhguru uh, and Swami Sarvapiyananda, they kind of, at least from the, the philosophies that I've heard, goes into how the fact that the world's temporary. And especially with Sadhguru, uh, with some of the talks he did in colleges were people believe that they deserve certain things there's kind of hints in that and this is something that i believe as well that you you don't go and force your 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 thoughts on anyone you don't you should not think that you deserve anything in life no matter what you do no matter how much good you've done you don't deserve anything in life again this goes more back to actually osho's teaching where um where you to some degree. There's some things I disagree with Osho. Or at least one, which is about children. <laughs> that this should be the village that raised it. Yes, to a, a degree, but it's your responsibility because you brought it into this world. Um, but um, about how you are only ever responsible for yourself. And I do believe that to be true. You, you are only ever responsible for yourself. And uh, that doesn't mean that you can't help other people, be kind to other people, but ultimately you are responsible for yourself go back on the topic i think i kind of skewed off a little bit it's kind of sad that indian philosophy is not taught in a lot of indian schools it's kind of harsh for him to say that in all indian colleges i don't know if that's true or not that's that's quite a statement to make maybe if he says like majority of indian, in indian schools are not taught indian philosophy then that's a tragedy honestly it's from what i've listened to um i will say this you could say it's not mandatory to teach that in schools but i or in colleges as a mandatory course. However, I think it should be an option to have like an extracurricular activity. Um, again, uh, when I went to college, I chose world religions because I was I was very curious about world religion to learn about the different religions and schools. Uh, what else did I, I remember very specifically choosing that because I wanted to hear and the thing that stuck out to me in that one was Buddhism about how the world is suffering. I, that's what my teacher told me and she was Indian too. She had the uh, the red dot in her forehead. I'm calling it that and not to be offensive or anything, but that's just the, that's what I noticed. That's how I can tell, I guess, maybe. I don't know if any other cultures do that. But anyways, that's what stuck out to me and it's like whenever she, whenever she said that, I'm like, the world is suffering and she gave the example of childbirth is suffering there's so, so much pain involved i'm like well I, I thought about modern medicine you know with the the, the numbing of the, the the childbirth so there's no pain involved anymore <laughs> but but outside of that i was like yeah I, I i never thought of i always think of childbirth as something so happy so glad and people are after the fact but there's still pain involved pain involved in that enjoyment and that's when I started really thinking a little bit, a little bit, about life.
strangely enough. In college, you start thinking about life. But anyways, I uh, I know in uh, I don't know if in all in American colleges that Indian philosophy is taught. I can only hope that it is at least an option um, to be uh, to be taught in college if you choose to get into Indian philosophy. And I do wonder if people who get into philosophy schools, whether it be psychology or something, have this as their option as well. I need to get into some Western philosophy as well, just to hear what their take on life or philosophy is. Anyways, that's my weird reaction to Indian philosophy in five minutes, which I did in 25 minutes. <laughs> so if you like my content, please consider subscribing, thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.